Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another Lazy CEO podcast. This is Jim Schlexer. I am your host and the founder of The CEO Project. Um, today, we've got an interesting guest. And I, I've spoken before about executive gravitas and the importance of your voice, um, I think particularly for women, frankly. Uh, this is something to learn and develop and lean into, but also men. Um, but everybody who wants to present in public, which we all do as leaders, want to present the right way. So our guest today is Allison Shapira. She's a former opera singer, a turned entrepreneur and keynote speaker. Um, she works internationally and she helps people improve their communication style. So specifically public speaking and, um, and communication. She teaches at Harvard. It's actually where she is today. We've got her coming in from Boston. She travels around the world uh, with her nonprofit Vital Voices Global Partnership. Um, she's a certified speaking professional. She's published uh, successful books and is a lifelong learner, a world traveler, and has taught public speaking on nearly every continent. I'm going to guess we're missing Antarctica, but we're going to find out. Um, but today we're going to learn about communication and improving our communication style. So, Allison, welcome so welcome to, to the show. We appreciate you coming. Thanks, Jim. Such a treat to be with you. A quick update or a quick correction on the nonprofit. Vital Voices is an amazing organization I work with. I did not found it. Um, it and so it's a terrific organization I've had the honor of, of working with for the past 10 years. Okay. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Uh, misread that. I apologize. So, um, well, let's just start with, you know, I, I've heard before the joke goes, you know, the number one fear is public speaking. It's actually a greater fear than death. And so the joke goes at a funeral, you'd rather be the person in the box than the person giving the eulogy, right? So how, how do we sort of start there, right? Like just the the fear that people have around getting up and speaking in public. How do we how do we get after that? What what what's your thinking there? The fear of public speaking is is shared by people around the world, no matter what background they have, where they live. It's really this universal fear. And that's because it comes from this this ancestral need to bond together in groups in order to to grow and the protection of your community thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago was was how we survived as a species. And so the idea that speaking up is an inherently risky proposition because you're elevating yourself or standing out from the group and the group is your source of safety. Even today, we know the importance of fitting in within our community or our organizations. So the idea of sticking out feels risky because it feels like we're unprotected. And yet, when we think about the purpose of public speaking, which I define as anytime you speak with one person or more, it's something that happens every day. And if we look at it, at it as an opportunity to exercise leadership, yes, to do something that feels risky, but to realize that the reward for that risk is a benefit to you in your career as a leader and of benefit to the people you lead because you're speaking up, usually not on your own behalf, but on their behalf, on behalf of the organization and your goals overall. And so once we reframe the purpose of speaking as not you taking a risk, stepping away from the crowd and, and at risk of death, you're looking at it as something that moves the entire crowd forward, the community comes with you together, then all of a sudden public speaking is an act of collaborative leadership that brings people along with you and leads to incredible change. You know that you remind me of the uh, the Japanese expression, you know, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down, right? <laughs> so which is a very collective society. So certainly you would get that from there. But and I love the the view that, you know, communication is a way to bring people into the met we're bringing people in through communication not it's not exclusionary it's 
inclusive as a methodology. So when when people are preparing to do public speaking, you know, what is your coaching around pre-speaking? What what's the mindset? What's the preparation tools? Uh, how should I get myself ready to perform well in front of a an org, a group, you know, two or more being the group, right? That's right. Recognizing that public speaking happens every single day in a meeting pitch or presentation, then the way we communicate starts from the inside out. It's how do I first communicate with myself so that I'm, then I can effectively communicate with my team and other external stakeholders. So it starts with identifying why am I called to speak up? whether it's to speak up in this meeting, to have this difficult conversation, what drives me in my work as a leader, and how do I connect with that sense of purpose? Because once I do that, then it's going to drive the way in which I communicate with others. And so often, as leaders, we're, we're too busy, we're running from meeting to meeting, and on the way to the meeting or in the negative two minutes between the one Zoom call running over and the next Zoom call, we ask ourselves, well, what do I wanna get out of this meeting? When really we need that period of strategy earlier on in the day or in the week where we think, how do I wanna show up as a leader? Who am I and what drives me? And now how can I use that sense of purpose to inform every communication that I have this week with an employee, with a client, with a center of influence? That's how I look at it. It starts from the inside out. Mm. You're being very uh, Simon Sinek in your, you know, start with why, right? And, and then we go from there. Um, and It's a common concept, yes. It is, and he just made it, in you know uber popular with this TED talk but um so I like that and I like the consistency of that line of thinking that starting with your purpose and working from there as a leader right we have a place we're going we have a purpose for doing it and then I can couch my communication in that it's authentic right and it's inclusive right and I think a lot of people go into it and they don't think about what is my outcome desired in this communication why am I having the communication before I have it. They kind of freewheel it, right? Um, interesting. So, when when we talk to CEOs about communication, we we use the Larry Bossidy rule, like three, right? You get three main points that you want to make. How do you talk to people about structuring their communication? And let's assume it's a little more of a I've got a little time to plot this out and communicate, maybe to a larger organization. How should I think about structuring my conversation with that kind of group, as opposed to an impromptu in a meeting is a little different, I think. Structure is critical when we're preparing a message, because very often the line of reasoning is very clear in our own heads, yeah. but it's not clear. <laughs> we're not, it's not clear to the people we lead or to those external stakeholders. And so without a clear structure that's obvious to our audience, the audience could be your entire team, your audience could be an, an external audience at a conference, without that structure, your audience isn't going to follow you. And if they won't follow you, they won't pay attention, they won't engage, you won't build trust, and you won't have the desired impact that you want to have. So once you've identified you know, why you care about this, why you're called to speak, you determine your goal for speaking, then it's time to look at the structure that you'd like to use. The rule of three is a timeless tradition that's critical because three is the shortest number or the smallest number that creates a pattern, mm. which means it's easy for your audience to remember. So it could be problem, solution, call to action. It could be three strategies that are going to drive this company forward. And so regardless of what that those three items are, it's helpful to have them clearly identified. And if you have 10 different concepts you want to share, remember, the more you say, the less people will hear. So it's really up to us to find, to condense those five, 10 concepts to three overarching themes and then have clear structures and transition points in place. So once you list that first concept, then you can say, now let's move on to the second concept. Thirdly, finally, we call those signposts and yeah. your ability to use signposts makes you so much more, appear so much more structured which makes it easier for people to follow and absorb your message. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I, I love that. And I love the uh, the signposting or or mapping your your communication. Um, yeah, you know, when we start the communication, are you where how do we start off our communication in a in a structured methodology? Is it established credibility? Is it a, like what is the first thing we should do when we get in front of an audience? Tell a joke? It really <laughs> no. No. <I> like using <laughs> well, there you humor. go. Rule number one. <laughs> Short answer, no. <laughs> I I the real answer is to all of your questions is it depends. Okay. It depends on who the audience is, how much they know you already, and how much credibility you've already built with them. Yeah. So if you're speaking to your team and you have a great relationship with your team, then you already have the credibility and the authority and respect to start the conversation. And so then you might start it with a with a personal story. You might start it with a shocking statistic, with a powerful visionary statement. I, my team teaches a number of different ways to, to start the, the speech or presentation. Humor can be effective, but humor is much broader than a joke. Hmm. A joke is a specific kind of humor. It's its own skill set, as any comedian or humorist will tell you, or as anyone who's ever tried to put a joke into their yeah. speech and failed will tell you. But there's a broader use of humor that can be effective if you if you know that it's going to work. And there are a specific set of requirements I recommend for that. If you don't know the audience very well and you haven't already built, built trust, then there are specific techniques that you can use to immediately establish credibility. It could be from the way someone introduces you, or it could be a personal story that you share that demonstrates the values you share with the audience, which helps them understand how much you have in common that builds trust. And right. then you can start to communicate the important messages you need to share. Got it. But it feels like that trust credibility is that how, depending on where you start and where you want to get to, but you've got to get to trust and credibility before they're ready to hear my message. The ultimate goal of, of any communication is to build connection, which leads to trust with your audience. Yep. And your audience might not trust you right away because they might not know you. But throughout the course of your argument, the, the logic, the persuasiveness, the authenticity of your argument builds trust because if you're hiding behind corporate talking points that yep. someone else wrote for you and gave you at the last minute, then your audience isn't going to trust you because they're going to know that's not really you in mm. front of them communicating. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've always said that, you know, if you have a writer that does work for you, if they don't have your voice, if you will, right, an authentic version of your voice, it's not going to work, right? They use words you would never use, they speak in patterns you would never use, um, then then you shouldn't have a speechwriter, just do it yourself. It, it's true. And if you do have a speechwriter, it's up to you to give them the time and attention so that they learn your voice. Yeah. So I work with executives who have speechwriters. And sometimes if those executives won't give their speechwriters time, even five minutes of their free form thinking before the speechwriter goes off and writes the mm -hmm. speech, then it's going to be a waste of time. You might as well just do it yourself. Invest in up leveling the speechwriter so that they know your voice and they they know your stories and what you like to say, then you'll ensure a much better outcome or product each time. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we see when um, people are well familiar with the material, right? So it's it's a it's a speech or something similar that I've done many many times is pace. So they go too fast, right? And when we're sort of trying to march an audience down my flow. And I'm going too fast. I'll just lose them. They can't capture the points. They can't hear what I'm saying. And so how do you help people manage their pace when they're doing communication? Pace can certainly be an issue because when you speak so quickly that people can't follow you, that you don't give them time to absorb your message, which means mm. you don't have the intended impact. Mm. So there are a number of techniques that my team teaches that, that force you to slow down mm as you move from sentence to sentence. And the easiest way I can, I can tell everyone to do that is to pause and breathe. Mm. And you pause and breathe, 
in a few different ways. You do it at the end of a sentence, which gives someone time to jump in with a question if it's a client meeting and you're rushing through your presentation, but the client has a pressing issue, gives them time to jump in. Mm. You pause and breathe after you've said something profound or fundamental, and you give people time to absorb their message, and to absorb your message. And then you pause and breathe when you forget what you were saying and think of <laughs> and give yourself time to think of the next thing yeah. to say instead of the, um, uh, yeah, so those filler words tell your audience you're unprepared. Just pause and breathe, nod thoughtfully, and then keep going. <laughs> it looks profound when you do that, not like you're lost, right? I know. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, no. Oh, no. What was I going to say next? Okay, I got it. That's funny. And I think we've all been in presentations where, and I think it comes from a place of confidence, right? That people feel like they have to fill the airspace and which allows nobody else any, there's no interjection point, particularly if you're trying to look for a dialogue in a sales presentation or a pitch meeting, or a, I think that use of pause to give somebody a chance to enter the conversation and truly make it a dialogue is super important. Um, and I like the breathing concept, but I, I think both the fear of speaking and that behavior is a confidence thing. You know, we're so nervous uh, that we feel like we've got to go fast because we got to get off the stage as quickly as humanly possible, right? It it could be confidence and it could also be skill. So public speaking is a skill and not a talent. That's a foundational belief of mine and of everyone on my team. The idea that you don't have to be born with it, just like nobody's born knowing how to run payroll or how to read a, a P&L statement. You, you learn, you look at it and you think, oh my goodness, what is this? Someone teaches you and you learn. And that's the same thing with public speaking. We might think extroverts are good at it, but that just means they like to talk. It doesn't mean they're any good at it. It's a series of competencies that we build. And the more we invest in them, the more confident we become because we have the skills to match our level of knowledge about our core competency. Mm, interesting. You know, I, I, I love, in addition to your sort of pausing, I also like repetition. And, and it seems weird when you do it. And I say, you know, uh, Allison, the point here is that we're going to go international. So we're going to go international. That's super important. Like just to repeat the point sometimes, um, it, it, use it for a purpose of em emphasis on the point to say, this is actually really important. I'm going to say it two times to make sure you realize it's important. Yes. And it's yep. it, repetition is a critical tool of rhetoric that we can use to reinforce a message. We shouldn't confuse it with redundancy. No, no. Which is right. when we repeat something that is unnecessarily repeating what we've already said. So there's a difference and and we can identify one and not the other. Interesting. Yeah, well, and maybe I'm guilty of repeating and not reiterating or I'm reiterating that repeating. I don't know. Whichever I'm doing the wrong one is what I'm doing. <laughs> it's important to have feedback from others in order to see is what's happening in our head having the intended impact on our audience. So that's also critical. Well, and I think on. that's super important to be monitoring your audience. Like, are they receiving your message? Like, look them in the eyeballs. Are they actually getting what I'm saying? Are they nodding their heads? Are they writing notes? Are they, uh, or have I lost them? Right. And I think that's important as well. It, it It is. The challenge with that is that our audience's body language and expression can be telling us something relevant to what we're saying, or it could be something completely different, mm. as in they're, they're furrowing their brow, they have this frowning expression on their face, and you find out later they were wondering if they had locked the door that day. Yeah. Or it's, had, they, yep. had milk, they put the eggs. laundry in? Milk? Did I, did I tell my <laughs> spouse? And so here we are reading yeah. their facial expressions, thinking, oh, no, they disagree with the strategy I've just proposed, when really, they're somewhere else entirely. So what I recommend speakers do is, instead of solely relying on the on the, the body language and the nonverbals of their audience, to plan actual questions or pauses in which we turn questions, we, we turn it over to our audience to say, let me pause here. Nancy, how have you dealt with 
mm -hmm. in the past. Steve, what do you think about this? And mm -hmm. then what we're doing is we're polling the audience to see if they agree with it. Or we can even say, Frank, I, I see you frowning. Tell me more about this. And then Frank can, can weigh in. So the more we're willing to make it a conversation as opposed to a speech, when the context is appropriate for it, we actually become more inclusive as leaders, as opposed to me standing on stage, delivering the solution. I'm actually bringing my team in to grapple with the challenges so that I have more buy-in on mm. the outcome and that it's a better, more inclusive buy uh, outcome as a result. No, but that's audience size related as well correct right when you're doing a big correct. keynote speech i mean there's some stuff you can do in that direction but you can't do what you you know nancy what do you think or marino what do you think or yeah it's, so i think that's a correct. size related thing but i love the methodology of asking questions to force engagement right into the conversation what about um what about pitch voice pitch when we're speaking um do you do any coaching in that space of like should I be up here? Should I be down here? Should I be down here? What, you know, how should I modulate my pitch when I'm speaking? It's less about our pitch because each one of us has our own natural range of of our voice. And and as a former opera singer, and I was going to say, I thought it was in your wheelhouse here. Come on, <laughs> it, it is the what I focus on is not what your natural range is and what what my team and i do is we look at the variety in the tone of your voice not the pitch like but the tone so if you're monotone speaking like this doesn't matter if you're up here speaking like this or down here speaking like this it's all monotone and it's tuning people out our tuning there was a play on words there yeah these i see what the, you did there. <laughs> the tone of your voice naturally rises and falls when we right. talk about the best restaurants in Washington, D.C., or we're frustrated about traffic on the Beltway. Then our voice has this wonderful range of emotion. When we're nervous or uncertain and we get in front of an audience, then we stop breathing because the nervousness closes off our throat and we start mm. to have vocal fry and it takes away one of our most powerfully expressive tools and in my keynotes what i'm always reinforcing to people is make sure the power of your voice matches the power of your words oh interesting because okay. if there's a disconnect between what you say and how you say it people will believe the how and they'll mistrust the what and the incongruence between those two elements will lead them to not trust you at all. So the flip side is when you speak, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in front of a large audience, make sure every part of you is communicating the same message give, from give your voice to your give gestures. Give us an example of that, Allison, of doing it wrong. Give us an example of that. I'm really happy to be here. And I think, <laughs> you know, as a, as a CEO, I always say, um, you know, the most important um, thing is your talent. And if you don't have your people, you don't have anything. I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> so what do you, do you believe the words or do you believe me looking at my watch? Because right. I'd rather receive messages than, than speak to you. That's right. an example of the disconnect. Got it. Interesting. I had another thought of like, I'm here today to talk about layoffs and, you know, it's going to be horrible, but you know, a few of you are not going to have a job tomorrow. And, you know, that's just kind of the way you're like, Ooh. and I'm really yes. sad about it. And it's just, I, I was up all night thinking about it. Like, you're like, this guy's a jerk, right? <laughs> another great example of that incongruence. That's right. Um, so, you know, as we sort of prepared, built some credibility and some trust, presented our message in a way that sort of reinforces and has a logical flow in a pacing that our organization, our group can understand. How do we bring that all together at the end? I mean, what's the big finish look like? How do we, um, and, and to some extent may depend on the objective of the conversation, but how do we end well, let's say when we, we speak, because, you know, there's what's the primacy and the, whatever you hear first and whatever you hear of last is generally what you're going to remember. How do you end well so that they remember your message? 
The end of the speech should summarize the core concepts and paint a picture of what the future will look like if they take your recommendations or your vision and, and act, take action on them. Mm -hmm. The end of the speech is not the time to introduce new information, which right. is a common mistake that leaders make. No, finish, the information was earlier, now we're summarizing. If it was a persuasive presentation, then we're summarizing in benefit language to the listener. So in conclusion, this new policy will give you more time with your family. It will make life easier in your day day-to-day -day work, et cetera. So it's benefit language. And then you end with a, the conclusion could be a quote. It could be a call back to the opening story that you started with. Your tone should change. So you shouldn't have to say thank you at the end no. because the finality of your voice in that last sentence should let the audience know that you've finished. Yep. I love that. I, I've always been coached. No, thank you. No, thank you very much. It should be. So if we do this and we deliver these results, we're all going to have an amazing year. Right. That's it's it. clear that's, that's the it. end of the you speech, the right? Thank you. No, yeah. if you want to put the thank you in, I go for it. I don't mind, yeah. but you don't need it. And if you're, if you are going to say it, you have to land it. You can't just say, thank you. You have to say, thank you. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Um, well, I, I love this. What do you see as some of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're trying to be effective in communication in this way? I mean, I think we touched on a couple, but you might have some others that we didn't touch on. Well, I teach the ACE model of leadership communication, which I've developed based on my work with executives and their teams over the past 20 years. And I found these three traits to be critical. And I say they're, they're important because they overcome mistakes that people mm. tend to make. The yeah. A stands for authenticity. So when leaders try to sound like someone else or hide behind jargon or talking points, they're unable to connect with their audience and they can't build trust. C stands for clarity. It's about the clarity of your message and not knowing, not just knowing everything there is to know about a subject, which in an age of AI is, is impossible. It's about being able to take everything in your head and create clear, concise language delivered with confidence, even in the face of uncertainty with mm. incomplete information. It's a critical leadership trait. And then the E stands for energy, which is recognizing that as a leader, your energy affects the energy of your entire team. And that's why that example of incongruence, when I said, hey, it's really great to be here, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm lowering the energy and productivity of everyone in the room by my tone of voice. And that's why I want to harness my best voice so that I can use that energy to inspire my team to bring their best energy to any challenge. So those are three strategies, traits that are critical that overcome the biggest mistakes that leaders Got tend it. to make Ace. at every level organization. Love it. I used to, um, whenever I would uh, get up in some of just to make sure they're paying attention, I'd, I'd sometimes go, you know, there are there are three things we need to remember. And I'd hold up four fingers, of course. And somebody inevitably go, you you have four fingers up there. I'm like, ha, here, somebody's watching. This is with a group I knew well. I would not do it with another audience. Uh, just on the confidence thing for a second, because I think some of us struggle with that. You know, in other words, I get that I want to present confidently and and because inspire the the audience that hey we're going in this direction but sometimes I I genuinely am not completely certain is it okay to say look here's where I think we're going here's why I think we're going here here are two or three things that are still you know bugs in my ear that I am not sure about and we're going to have to figure these out is it okay to be fully transparent about the fact that I am not perfectly confident about this I'm like mostly confident about it? Absolutely. That's a key point in, in my keynotes when we talk about clarity. Clarity does not mean uncertainty. And there's a wonderful quote that I, I like to use from the futurist, Dr. Bob Johansson, who says, the future will punish certainty and reward clarity. Mm. Like that. And what I love about that is it liberates us from needing to have all the answers because it's impossible. And what our teams, what our, our audiences are looking for is confidence in 
the process we're going to use to get the information that we need. So I don't know what the outcome is, but I am clear in what I do know and what I don't know. And in the process I'm going to use, is to get the information that I need. And I take confidence in that process, not in having all the information. So we have to reframe where confidence comes from. Got it. Uh, I got it. Yeah. And I, and I always loved, um, you know, Senge's and Arliss's before him, uh, ladder of inference, right? Let me expose my thinking to you so that you, here's the data, here's how I interpret it, here are the conclusions I draw. You can you can go after it at any point and not agree with me, but you know how I'm thinking, at least how I got to that answer. Um, I've always thought that was powerful as a leadership technique. It um, is, and it's a powerful speech technique as well. Mm. So what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you, Allison? You mentioned earlier on that you find these skills are important for women. I, I, and I, then you, you hedged it and you said everyone needs it. And I wanted to, to emphasize that everyone needs these skills regardless of gender. In my work with women leaders, both in the US and around the world, I find when women lack these skills, it holds us back more because we're usually in the minority in these leadership positions. So people seem to be paying more attention to every little thing that we do either well or poorly. But, but public speaking for women is no different than public speaking for anyone. It's simply these skills are disproportionately affecting us when when we don't represent the majority in the room. So I wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, and and it's a fair comment. My my comment came from I I've actually ended up coaching a number of women on public speaking, you know, and so maybe it's a small sample set that I'm interpreting as meaning something, but um I I probably spent more time on that topic with the women I coach than the men generally. Uh maybe the men are inappropriately confident about their skills, perhaps. But um, anyway, so that's where it came from. So it wasn't meant to be. I understand. That. Um, well, great. Well, I know you've written a book and you you do consulting in the space, but how would people find you, Allison, if they wanted more of what you do in their lives and thought that you could be helpful to them? Well, I, I, I'm very active on LinkedIn and encourage anyone to reach out and connect with me, follow me. I'm happy to answer questions. My, my keynote speeches are what I'm most excited about right now and sharing this message with audiences. And then I'm so proud of the team that I have at Global Public Speaking, which delivers the one-on-one -on -one coaching and the group training to really build these transformational communication skills for leaders. So if it's if it's keynotes or, or the book people are interested in discussing, AllisonShapira.com is the way to reach me. And then if it's the training programs that my team delivers, we're globalpublicspeaking.com. Perfect. And the name of the book again? Actually, I have a couple, Speak, right? Speak with Impact, How to Command the Room and Influence Others is the first book. And the second is Speak with Impact Virtually, How to Apply All the Skills from Speak with Impact in a Virtual or Hybrid Setting. Wow. Particularly relevant, I think, in today's, you know, global virtual team environment that we're exactly. operating in. So, yeah, fabulous. Exactly. Well, Allison, this was spectacular. You gave some really interesting points, I think, for all of us that end up doing public speaking and um, and maybe some reminders as well of things we were supposed to know and we aren't really doing. So this was a tremendous use of time. Thank you so much for coming and helping us out. I appreciate it. My pleasure. What a treat to be with you. Thank you. We'll see you next time on the Lazy CEO podcast. This podcast is brought to you by The CEO Project. At The CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.